up next, we have Fatima Bonatwala. She's a security engineer with the University of Delaware. And uh, she's taking the stage now, if you'll give her a warm welcome. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. I hope you guys had a good lunch. And today I'm going to talk about the DNSSEC protocol parser in this presentation. But before jumping into that, a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Parma. I work as a security engineer in University of Delaware's uh, security operations team. I have been working there for four years. Uh, I joined in 2015, and I have been working on Zeek for past four years because my main responsibilities in um, security operations team is to maintain and manage the SIEM systems and the IDS and IPS systems for the university team. Apart from my full-time job, I'm a part-time PhD student, and then my uh, research focuses more on the uh, security of the DNS, DNS protocol, and it's all uh, variants like DNSSEC and DOH and DOT. Uh, and then, okay, so agenda. For, agenda for today's talk is to go over the uh, goal and motivation, uh, so why we actually started writing the DNSSEC protocol parser. We will be getting, uh, we will be doing some kind of deep dive into the code, uh, with, uh, with mentioning all the steps that were involved. Uh, I came up with the, um, with the name called top-down approach because eventually we will get there and you would know why. And then I will, find, I will finally summarize the talk with some takeaways and uh, some of the final steps that uh, can help you guys in future if you guys are willing to write code and contribute code to, to Zeek repository. So before jumping into the talk, a quick look at what University of Delaware's traffic looked like. We have multiple 10 gig links. Uh, uh, we have multiple 10 gig, 10 gig links. We have, uh, for each link, we have almost uh, five Gbps worth of uh, speed on average on a business day, uh, a busy business day. And then the peak usually goes up to eight to nine Gbps on each link. Uh, Z cluster, so we have a production Z cluster that monitors the north-south not so traffic, which means that all the traffic that is coming from the internet and going outside the internet. Uh, so we do maintain the internet uh, traffic monitoring with our Z cluster. Uh, we are coming up with the internal traffic monitoring, knowing the fact that there are some kind of uh, adversaries that might lie inside the network. So we are kind of like, we have complicated networks. So we are kind of like struggling in how to get the taps inside the network to do, with, to do the internal traffic monitoring, but it's coming up. But currently, we have a production cluster of four Zeek workers. Uh, they sniff on two 10 gig links that are directly connected to our border router. So that's how we are getting all the internet traffic. That is our north-south traffic. And each gets the 25% of the total traffic. And that's why each, each sensor is capable of doing up to 10 Gbps worth of speed uh, if, if maintained on the peak hours. And then uh, for, for the packet, a packet uh, per second rate, each gets on, on an average, each, each box gets 300,000 pack, 300, packets per second with a peak of almost 1 million packets per second without any kind of capture loss. Okay, so the goal of this presentation, again, uh, is to walk you through the steps that were taken when we were, doing the, when we, when we were doing some analysis and we found out that there are some RR types. RR stands for resource record. So when we were doing some analysis of uh, weird.log file that we will get to it eventually, uh, so we realized that we have to write the parsers. And then uh, I was just like that, okay, if we have started doing that, it would, it would be nice to share that kind of experience and what all the steps that were taken as a security engineer perspective, not a software developer perspective. And it would be helpful for sharing those thought process and steps to the peers so that they can find some use out of it. Uh, and then, and, and then the focus of the talk will be to encourage the people uh, who are not specifically the hardcore programmers or the code writers to actually contribute towards uh, the Zeek open source project because it's not that as scary as it seems that I don't know how to code or how, I don't know what to write. So that's the main focus of this talk. And that's why I have taken DNSSEC as an example to go over all the steps that were involved. Okay, so the main motivation of this talk came from the weird.log file analysis that we did last year. And we realized that, oh, so before doing that, weird.log is one of the log files that Zeek generates, and it, it notes all weird activity that it thinks it's weird, uh, which is unexpected or unusual activity that is going on on your network, and it logs everything in the weird.log file. It's one of the log files that gets generated. If you guys are running Zeek in production, you must have seen that file. 
so the motivation was actually when we were analyzing that weird.log file just to know what exactly is going on, we realized that we have almost 200 unique, 200 unique weird notices that were actually getting triggered. And we wanted to uh, investigate that whether these notices are true positives, false positives to take some action, because if they are true positives, we would, we would like to know why they are actually happening on our network. So to investigate that, we need to know the condition, because how are you going to know whether, just by looking at the log file, whether this weird is a true positive and I should take an action. So just to verify that the condition that is triggering the, those weird, weird is actually happening on your network, you need to know where exactly the conditions are defined. So where to find them? So there are two main locations in which you can actually find the conditions that are defined for majority of the weirds. And if you guys have uh, uh, attended uh, yesterday's session, which is introduction to Zeek, you, you guys might be, fam be familiar with the base slash policy folders, uh, which is the second part. So the first part is the core layer source code of Zeek in .cc files. So when developers are writing protocol, and, uh, protocol analyzers and parsers, there are some conditions that are unexpected or very interesting conditions that you would like to get notified about or something that should not really happen. So though, for all those conditions, they are, defined in the, uh, they are defined in the .cc file, and for those conditions, the weirds are raised in the source code. For scriptlan, there are some conditions that are easy to handle in the scriptlan script land than source code, and for all those conditions, they are defined in the base slash policy, base slash and policy, policy slash folders. Those folders primarily have .zeek scripts in it, so these are the two main locations where you, where you can actually find the conditions that gets your weirds triggered and raised and logged in weird.log file. Okay, so as I, as I mentioned before, that the main objective, uh, so we were not about writing something, but when we were doing analysis of weird.log file, we noticed that there were three main um, weird notices that were getting triggered on our network, and the top one, top one, the top one on the list was DNS RR unknown type. So the first command, we actually ran that command on one day worth of log files, which is, that's why it's weird.stars.log.dz. And the, the seventh column is the column that actually notes the string that corresponds to the weird notice. So, and the first column is the total number of count. So the first, uh, so, so we, we were focusing on triaging the top most triggered weirds so that we can actually filter out the noise from the weird.log file and then we can actually focus on some activity that is not very usual on our network. So we picked up on DNS RR unknown type and the name in itself is pretty intuitive. So there are some RR types that are currently not known to Zeek and that's why they are getting triggered and logged in weird.log file. So the another question was, so the next question was what all RR types are currently unknown to Zeek? So the second command on the slide, which says, uh, uh, which says the same command, but it also logs another column corresponding to, the, uh, cor corresponding to that integer, the last column. So that is the integer ID that actually gets logged with, together with the DNS RR unknown type to, know, to show which integer value or which RR type ID is currently not being parsed in Zeek. So those were the five top ones that we found. And um, now the question was at what those five integer types are and what their corresponding RR types names are. So for that, if you do a quick Wikipedia search for all those five uh, RR type ID, you would get to know that those five belongs to those five type names. So the 46 is RR sig, which is resource, resource, resource record signature. That type actually contains the digital signature of the RR set that was signed by the zone. 50 and 47, the NSEC, which is next secure record, they actually are for the um, handling of the uh, non-existent errors, like the negative errors that usually DNS has. For example, NX, NX domain, non-existent domain. 53 is delegation signer, sorry, 43 is delegation signer. That record actually has the digital, not digital, sorry. That record actually has the hash of the key signing key of, this, of the child zone. That's why it's called digital sign, uh, delegation signer. Did I say digital signer before? I'm sorry if I, say, if, if I did that. So 43 is delegation signer, and it contains the hash of the key signing key of the child zone. 48 is a DNS key. Uh, it is a pretty important record because the digital signature is, is based on how you would verify it. And for verification, you need to give your clients the public key 
corresponding to the private corresponding to the private key pair for which uh, for which from which you sign the record. So the DNS key type 48 has the uh, has the public key corresponding to the key pair. So the reason for getting those five types triggered a lot in our weird.log file was our DNS servers, uh, they were supporting DNSSEC requests and responses. So we, we, provide, we do provide DNS as a backup. So for, for the clients for which we provide DNS as a backup, they have implemented full-fledged DNSSEC on their environment. So whenever there are queries that come to our DNS servers as a backup for their domain, for their domain resolution, we will get almost 90% of the traffic just based on the DNSSEC. And for, and for, and for that 90% of the traffic, Zeek will just log that these types are unknown because DNSSEC is not currently parsed. So that was the reason behind why we were getting those five types as triggered a lot in weird.log file. So getting started, so as I mentioned that if you want to know whether the, whether the weird type is, uh, or whether the weird notice in your weird.log is a true positive or false positive, you need to find the condition. So getting started step by step, so we wanted to find the condition, so we knew now that, okay, this might be happening, but we just wanted to verify what exactly is the condition that is triggering that. So for DNS are unknown type, as I mentioned before, that there are two places where you can actually find the condition that is defined. First one is the script line. So the first command, uh, for, for the red command, that is the grep command. I'm just doing a grep of uh, the string RR, DNS RR unknown type recursively in the share folder because that's where all the scripts live. And it was, uh, if you guys have attended yesterday's introduction to Zeek session, you might know already by this time. So that, uh, so running that command gave me a hit and it said that in on line 122 in weird.bro script in slash, bla slash base slash framework slash notice folder, there's a hit. And the line that actually has that string is also mentioned and it is some kind of like uh, a record, not record, uh, some, time of, some, some time of the table of string and then it's, it has some value in it. It doesn't look like it would have the condition but it doesn't hurt to take a look into the file. So in scriptland, we found, so this is the snippet of the weird.bro, and it just, it just shows, you the, shows you the hit from, uh, it just shows you the hit where actually it finds the DNS are unknown type, and it looks like it's a table of action for all the weird notice types that gets triggered in the network, and by default, the action is action log. So even though we didn't find the triggering condition, we got to know about a script that lives in the script land for, for controlling the action. So if you want to suppress the weird, if you want to suppress the weird notices, you can actually, if the notice is already there, you can change the action from action log to action, action ignore, and it will completely bypass the logging in weird.log file. If you, if you want to suppress it, suppress it. and if, if that weird notice is not defined in that table, then you can actually define it with the action ignore, because that table does not have all the weirds that get raised and triggered in Bro in Zeek. So uh, we still have to find the condition that triggers that weird notice and gets logged in weird.log file. So the second location where we can find or we can expect to find the condition is the source code. So we have compiled Zeek from source, so that's why we have source lying around on our box. But if you have not compiled, you can actually pull, pull down the source from uh, GitHub or their website or the, or the Zeek website. So doing again the same command in the source folder, uh, looking for the DNS other unknown type string, we actually found a match. And that match is actually in dns.cc file on line 326. And it says analyzer, some kind of arrow, weird with, w, with capital W, and then the string, and then something is passed as well as an argument. It is or as a value. It is a type, and it is some kind of integer. So it makes sense that the second column that we were getting, the integer column for the DNS RR unknown type, RR unknown type in weird.log, it can potentially be that integer that is getting passed. So it looks like from the dry analysis of code and by running these commands, it, these are just simple grep commands. So uh, it looks like that DNS.cc is the file we might want to take a look at to find the condition that actually triggers that weird type. So just to recap, uh, we know, so we started with weird.log file. The topmost uh, top triggered weird was DNS RR unknown type. We wanted to find the condition that actually triggers that weird. We looked into the script land. We didn't find the condition. But the good thing is we did find a script that can be used to suppress the logging of the weirds. 
we are suspecting that the condition might be defined in dns.cc file. And to look into the um, source code before deep diving into the source code, some of the tips, uh, some of the recommendations is to actually have a really good text editor. I personally use Sublime because it is a great editor tool, and it actually lets you navigate through the um, code files pretty easily. Like you, if you hover to one function which, where it is de de declared, it will actually show you that what all other files have that function defined or declared somewhere in those files. So it's pretty easy to navigate between the files if you're using Sublime, but you can use any other uh, code editor. The reason to use a code, edit code editor is uh, it highlights the properties. It highlights some of the important fields, uh, important functions, and the things that are um, reserved for that coding, coding uh, programming language. So it's really good to understand the code efficiently. You should, uh, you should always use a code editor. Use the, use the tool you're comfortable with, and then you, again, you need the source code because you cannot look for uh, dns.cc if you do not have source code. So get it from a GitHub or website or their website if you do not have if you would not, if you didn't compile it from source. So let's take a look at the dns.cc file. So this snippet, so dns.cc is a pretty long file because it has more than 20 different kind of DNS RR types parsed in it. So anyway, so I have actually taken the snippet of the condition that actually raises that weird and which is circled there. And that was the string that actually was found by the grep as well. So it looks like that there is a switch case statement going on, and this is a switch case statement. It's just it's so long that I just couldn't pull out the complete uh, uh, complete snippet. So it looks like that there are some types for which the switch case statement looks for, and when when it matches that type, so the traffic. Uh, so if the DNS message has that type that may, that matches one of the case statements, it actually calls a function called parse rr with that type, which must be defined somewhere in the source code. And then by default, it has a catch all statement. That means for all the RR types that do not have the corresponding parser function defined in the code, all those are caught by that default statement. And, and that was the reason that, that DNS RR unknown type was getting raised because all those five types didn't have that corresponding pars parser functions defined in the source code, source code. So now the question is that what all types are parsed in the source code? So to to get a quick answer, you can actually take a look at dns.header file. So it has the enum type definition. So all these type strings that you can see, uh, all these were used in switch case. We have to be very careful. So it can be confusing. Not all the enum types that are defined here actually have the corresponding parser function. So for example, the type uh, T key, it was confusing because there are some types that are actually in this uh, enum type definition they are declared, but they, they are not used in dns.cc files. So if, if I go back, so in this switch case statement, you can see type edns and type tsig and corresponding parser functions called. You can define them, you can declare them here, but you might not use them in dns.cc. So for example, type t, uh, t key uh, 249, it's declared here, but it does not have the corresponding parser function. So it might be a little bit confusing. So if you're trying to look at what exactly are the other types that are parsed, you need to match that, okay, this is the type defining the type, type, uh, type def in them, and then that is used with the switch case to call the parser function. So anyway, so this is the um, dns.header file that actually defines, declares some of the types that are used in the, case, in the switch case statement in dns.cc file. So now we are in top-down approach. All we have done so far is very quick uh, and a dry analysis of code so far. We haven't touched the code, we haven't programmed anything. So analysis so far. After looking at the dns.h and dns.cc file, we found that there are so many RR types that are already being parsed in Zeek. So we can actually follow one of the RR types that is already parsed, and then we can see that if we can follow that or if we can stock that type in the code to see if uh, we, can, we can write a corresponding protocol parser that matches closely that type. And then after taking a quick look at dns.header file, looks like there is a type called type tsig, which is type, uh, which is 250, that is defined in the header file. And it has corresponding parser uh, function as well in dns.cc file, the second snippet. So the first snippet is from the dns.h, the second is from the dns.cc. So now I found the type that I can actually follow 
to see how exactly the parser code is written for that type because that matches closely to one of the DNSSEC types that I want to parse because TSEC is transaction signature RFC 2845. So that's kind of like the top-down analysis. You just stalk a type throughout the code, see where exactly it is defined, what all functions it is interacting with, what all variables are defined for that type, and you just follow through the code. So that's why it's called top-down analysis. We didn't start from coding and then moving up. We started from analyzing and then moving down. Analysis so far, okay. So um, let's get started. So dns.cc is, is our main file. We have only looked into two files so far, dns.cc, which we found from grep, and then dns.header file, because it was included in dns.cc file. So this is the switch case statement that had the type that will parse that type if it sees that packet in the network traffic with a type. It's, it looks like that whenever the type is matched and whenever that case statement is matched to that type, there is a function called parse RRTSIG, which is being called passing all the information that is already parsed in Zeek. And the same function is defined in the same uh, code file, dns.cc, and looks like that it looks like that, that this is the function call and it is calling that function passing all the variables and all the data that it has already extracted from the DNS message packet. So the first thing is done. We don't even need to, uh, we, didn't, we don't even need to write the scratch, write the code from scratch of parsing each and every byte from the packet. It's already done. It's just getting passed to the function. There are, it's just the high level analysis, so I'm not going into detail of extracting and parsing all the fields from the data. And that's why it's like, from 730, it's six, uh, 761. So there is a lot of code that is already written to parse the bytes and extract them, extract all the fields from the data packet, data field. The reason is because I wanted to highlight two important things in the high-level analysis. First one is the new connection event. It's very important because connection events, uh, if you are a little bit familiar with Zeek, connection events are the events that get raised whenever Zeek sees those kind of packets in the traffic. So there is a new connection event called DNS TSIC additional that is used in this function. So that's one of the important points. The second important point is right before that function is called, there is another function that is called called build TSIC value. That means if the packet, if the DNS message has DNS type TSIC in it, there, is the, there are the fields that are getting extracted from the packet by that function. And that function actually has a new record type defined in it, which is DNS TSIC additional. So these are the two important points that I, that I wanted to highlight uh, in this uh, high level overview of uh, top down approach. So these are the two things that we know so far. So analysis so far, uh, after taking a look into the DNS.cc file, we picked a type that we want to follow or we want to stock, which was type TSIC. We traced it, we traced it in the log, uh, in the in the code file to see where exactly, what exactly are the functions that it calls, where exactly it is defined, and what all variables are involved in it. So the first thing was we found a function which was parse RRTSIG. Another good thing about Zeek, <laughs> Zeek developers are they have written the code that is self-explanatory, so they have not vaguely defined any functions. So even just by looking at the function names, you kind of get an idea what exactly might be happening in the function. So parse RRTSIG RRT is kind of like self, self-explanatory function that it might be parsing the DNS RR type TSIG. So we got to know that, okay, there is a function that is written that, that parses that value or that packet. In that parser function, there are two important things happening. One, the connection event, which is DNS TSIG additional that is being used. And then the second one is the new record type, uh, DNS TSIG additional that will contain all the values that are extracted from the packet that corresponds to the DNS type, DNS resource record type TSIG. And this is just by looking at the DNS.cc and DNS.h file. So there is still so many things that are unknown before even we start writing the code. The unknown things are what all code, there is a new connection, there is a new connection and a new record type. There has to be some other files there where they are declared and defined and handled. So this is still unknown and I don't know where to look for it, right? So I got back to find. So th this is a snippet from, um, from the Sublime where I actually ran find. So it's a really cool feature of Sublime that you can actually run find on directory for a string that you want to find. And what it will do is it will show you all the 
files in which it has found that string with a couple of codes, a couple of lines of code before and after that string. So when I ran, when I ran uh, a find on the source, source code of uh, Zeek to find the DNS TSIG string, it actually gave me five hits. The first one was the initbear.bro, init and it can say, it, you can see that it says that searching 6,000 files for DNS TSIG, the first one, it is excluding the DNS.h and DNS.cc because we have already talked about it. So the first one is the initbear.bro, and it looks like that the new record type that we were seeing in DNS.cc is actually defined here with all the values that it will be containing or actually with all the fields that it will be containing and the field type, for example, query, string, queue type counts. So we, no, we now know that, okay, we have a location where we can actually define the new record type and all the fields corresponding to it. And the second one is the main.bro. It's a pretty, uh, so all the protocol parsers in script land, in script land have main.bro, which actually handles the event. So if you want to do some additional customization or additional parsing or additional logging or anything, you can handle that event in the main.bro file. So it's commented out right now because it is not handled right now uh, and not logged anymore in the ns.log file, but it is definitely can be handled in the uh, main.bro for uh, DNS uh, TSIG type, DNS TSIG RR type. The third one is the events.bif. Events.bif is the file where actually the new, new connection events are declared. So you can actually see that there's a declaration of the new connection event that was used in DNS.cc in the events.bif file. The fourth and fifth dns.war and dns. Uh, netwar.cc and netwar.h, they actually have the internal type declaration for the new record type that we used in, uh, that was used in dns.cc file. So in, a, in summarizing, uh, the files that we actually saw that would need the extension are these files. So all these are the files that now we know that would need the extension, that would need the extension if we ever would like to write the protocol parsers for, uh, for other DNS RR types that are currently unknown to Zeek. We have already mentioned DNS.header and DNS.cc. Header file will have all the new types and functions declarations. DNS.cc will be the file where actually the parser code will go. Netwar.h and netwar.cc will have the internal record type declaration. Initbear will have the new record type definition with all the fields and, uh, fields and field types. Events.bif will have a new event declaration and the main.bro will, will be able to handle the new, uh, new events that will be raised when bro sees that, that traffic in the network. So once you write all the uh, parsing code and for especially, specifically for the five uh, types that we have discussed so far uh, that were unknown, we actually wrote the parser for we actually wrote the parser for those five types, and these are the new event types that are now introduced in Zeek to handle those um, five types for additional customization or additional logging. So the blue ones um, that you see are the actually events that will now get raised whenever Zeek will see the network traffic having all those five, or one of those five types in your network. And if you guys support or if you guys are seeing the DNSSEC, uh, DNSSEC traffic, then one of these events will raise for one of those types, if you're seeing that. The green ones are the record types. They are the new record types that are introduced that will actually have all the fields that will get extracted whenever Zeek sees one of those event or one of those packets having one of those uh, RR types. So DNS RR, DNS RR, SIG RR, and then DNS, it's pretty easy, DNS underscore DNS key dot uh, underscore RR. So all these green ones are the new record types that you can actually use if you want to customize uh, or if you want to handle these events in script land. Okay, so, uh, so this DNSSEC uh, parsing support is available now in Zeek 3.0. So before, if you, guys are, uh, if, you, if you guys are running a version that is not 3.0 or older, the DNS.log file would look like this, where, where if your um, Zeek cluster is seeing the traffic that has one of those types, it will be just recorded as unknown type 46 and 47. Here, 46 is RRSIG and 47 is NSEC. But if you are running Zeek 3.0, the DNS.log file would look like that, where actually Zeek will correctly parse those uh, unknown types as the type for which we have written the parser. So 46 will be RRSIG, and then 47 will be NSEC. These are not exactly the same uh, mapping, but you can get an idea of how the log files would look like in before and after 
if you have um, Z3.0 installed and running. One more thing to note here, uh, as I mentioned, that if you go and see the RFCs of one of those types, there are a lot of things that are going on, like the packet has a lot of fields, and those fields can be really useful. So only the type is defined, only the type is logged in dns.log. There's a whole bunch of fields that you can actually play around with if you want to do ex additional logging of one of those types. And, and for that, here's a quick example of additional logging. So this example shows the handling of the event DNS key. So the event DNS underscore DNS key, if we are handling this event in this uh, block file, that, where, that whenever there will be a packet with the DNS key or our type in it, we, we will have three more fields that will be additionally logged in dns.log file. So it's just extending the dns.log file to include those three fields that are already parsed in Zeek, but it's not currently, it's not currently logged by default in dns.log file. So you can either extend dns.log file with all the fields that you want to track in the network, or you can actually write a custom log file like DNS, dnssec.log or any other, or whatever name you want to give to it. And then you can, uh, you can uh, start logging all that information corresponding to either RRSIG or DNS, DNS key or whatever your use case is. So this is just an example of uh, how the additional logging would look like and how would, how would you handle the, excuse me, how would you handle the events in the scripting land. So top-down approach summary. So the, the steps that we haven't talked about yet, so all the steps that we have talked about so far is related to the coding and uh, what you can uh, do by doing just a dry analysis of code and high-level uh, analysis of code and following one of the types that you can actually stock for uh, coding your parsers. But the thing is that there are so many steps that are involved before even doing all that stuff. So these are, the, some, these are some of the steps that you can actually go through to uh, write coding, uh, to write the either extensions or coding support for uh, the protocol parsers if you would like to write in the future. So first is capture the sample, sample traffic using TCP dump or any other uh, PCAP library that you would like to use to capture the traffic because you need to see the packets that how they look like in packet land so before st even starting parsing them out. The second one is uh, analyze the packets. Uh, capturing Wireshark is a great tool. I like it because it gives you the um, really good dissection in human readable format of all the header, all the header fields, uh, all the data fields, what, what's going on in the packet, and you can actually highlight the uh, fields corresponding to the header values. So uh, IP header has its own um, start and end and then the TCP or UDP, like transport, transport layer has the, its own fields. So I love Wireshark because it has really good protocol analyzer, and if you can uh, dissect that using Wireshark, it's, it becomes super easy to know the boundaries of what field starts where. If it's an integer field, what's the corresponding human readable value of that? So I like Wireshark for doing that kind of analysis. The third step is very, very important. It's like read and understand the RFCs. You need to know the packet structure for that protocol. And RFCs are kind of like blueprints. They tell you that what all fields are involved, what fields, what you can expect the value on that, in that field, what is the starting and what is the ending of that field, how long the, a field can, can be, whether it's a variable length field, a fixed length field, and what are the boundaries. And if you mess up with the uh, parsing of one byte, after that, everything is messed up because you have just missed one of the uh, boundaries. So it's very important that you read the RFC and understand what exactly is going on and how the packet structure looks like. Because once you have understand that how the packet structure looks like, what all fields are involved and what fields mean what, it becomes just uh, the matter of coding it efficiently. And Zeek has more than 50 different protocol parsers, so you do not have to write the code from scratch. It has all the basic functions to extract one byte, two byte, four byte, eight byte, or the X number of bytes from the packet. You just need to know where to call them and how to call them and when to call them. So it's not like that you need to write the code from the scratch that, okay, this is the packet, I need to extract the first byte, I need to extract the second byte. It's already there. It has more than 50 protocol parsers, so it has to be there. You just need to know how to use them. So that's why you don't need to reinvent the wheel. It's already there. It's just the matter of the referencing of code and where you can find that code or where, or where you can find a snippet that you can actually reuse in your code. And then you can start with something simple and then move your way up to it. 
finally, some takeaways. Uh, contribute back. So contribute back to the Zeek Open Source project. If you see something, do something. It all started with our weird .log analysis last year that, that, that we did. And then we found something that if you find that Zeek is missing some functionality or it would be really good to have or nice to have functionality in Zeek, you can go for it. Uh, and it's always fun to learn more about the uh, most widely used NSM in the, in, the, in the industry. So the funny story, the last time I was presenting this talk, that line was not that. It was, it's fun to learn more about the, everyone's favorite NSM in the industry. And I got called out saying, how do you know it's everyone's favorite? And I'm like, yeah, I should have really mentioned an asterisk or terms and conditions apply. So I actually changed it and made it like it's fun to learn more, uh, more about the most widely used. And I still have the asterisk, so user's discretion is advised. Um, you don't, second point is very important. So you don't have to be pro in coding. It's not, if there is a misconception in industry that I am not a full-time developer, I am not a programmer, I am not a software engineer, I am not going to write the code because I don't know anything about the code, which it is not true. If you have some basic knowledge and understanding of any of the programming language, the fundamentals remains the same. The concepts remains the same. You can easily follow through the code. So if you just look at one code, you will be able to follow through it. So it's not, that's, that's a misconception that I am not a full-time developer, I am not a full-time programmer, so I would not be able to write the protocol parser or contribute back to the source code. It, it's so heavy and I need to learn C++ or C from the scratch or whatever programming language the code is written in from the scratch, which is not true. Just some smart techniques of code referencing, code reusing can get you a long way. And more importantly, you will develop a new skill set to show off. So I had, uh, I had one of the SANS, um, I have one of the SANS instructors that had, he belonged to the advanced human race. He can actually read the hex dump on the fly and decode at least four layers in his head that's saying, okay, it's an IPv4 packet, TCP. And I was like, how do you get that? It's a hex dump. And he just belongs to the, like he has done it so many times that now whenever he sees the hex packet, he's like, yep, I have already decoded four layers for you. Just like the Wireshark decodes each, each and every layer for you. He just does that. And then you never know if you, if you keep doing that, you might also belong to one of that, uh, one of the persons from that advanced human race. I am not a part of that advanced human race yet, but you might become one. So these are the advantages of, you know, contributing back and learning something new, some new skill to it. Last but not the least, uh, acknowledgement, that's the best part. I always thank us amazing Zeek team for all the support in providing the answers because without them it wouldn't be possible. I would highly encourage you to uh, be a part of the mailing list if you're not already. No matter on what level you actually are on Zeek, if you're a beginner, you can ask all sorts of questions. If you're intermediate or expert, you can answer those questions. So I would highly, highly encourage you to check that out. There's another mailing list for Zeek developers. So if, you try, if you're trying to write a code, or if you're trying to uh, contribute back, or if you're trying to just develop a parser, but you are struggling with some of the problems that you're having, you can actually feel free to write, um, write that question up in the email, in e and email that to the Zeek developers mailing list, and some, some person will actually get back to you with a better solution. So that's another mailing list you can actually be part of if you are developing something new or developing or extending the Zeek's functionality. And then thanks for the opportunity to, to be the part of the first Zeek Week 2019. I have been attending BroCon for three years, but this is my first time in Zeek Week. So I'm really glad to get the opportunity to present in Zeek Week, first ever Zeek Week event of the, of the century. So, <laughs> all righty, I can take questions. That's it. Wake up, people, wake up. It's over. Trauma is over. Go ahead. Uh, so my, I'm, I'm researching the uh, longitudinal kind of study of what algorithms are being used in the, uh, especially RR SIG record and DNS key record. And the, you, they usually do a rollover of key. So it just, just by knowing that what SHA, in DS, in delegation signer, you can see that what hash uh, functions they are using, it's, is it MD5 or SHA1? So it's just like more information. I haven't developed any analytics yet but I'm just collecting the information because DNSSEC is pretty new. Nobody even notices that half of their traffic in DNS is DNSSEC because it's not being parsed yet. So if you're, if you're running Zeek 3.0, you will now have more visibility in your DNS traffic than before. So if that answers your question. Sure. Uh, 
Uh, good question. So the question is that how did you do the testing before either pushing out the package or extending the function? the change. So it's not a package, it's the extension to the parser and it's directly merged into, into the source code. Uh, Zeek has the b-test that you can run on the sample pcaps and it produces the results and you have to actually do that before even uh, trying to uh, do a pull request, I believe. So I did that, but before doing that, I didn't know about that. So when I did a pull request, I got to know that I need to run b-test on some of the samples to generate a baseline. Uh, but for before that, I was just doing everything locally. So I have captured the production traffic uh, for which Zeke was saying that it is unknown type and I don't recognize it. I had the PCAPs, very small PCAPs, 15, 20 megabytes should, should be good, one gigabyte, it should be good. Uh, and I was just running the code. So I have compiled the code and built the code locally and I was just running that code, reading that PCAP file and seeing the logs. So that's how I was doing. I was not even extending the dns.log file. I was actually logging everything in a new file. So that was the initial phase of testing. But Zeek does have B-test that you can use to baseline the scripts. <coughs> Any other questions? All right, well, thank you so much, guys. <laughs>